meeting is being recorded. Um, and so that way, if you have other neighbors that weren't able to join us this morning or, or didn't find out about the meeting, uh, this recording will be available to them. And then I'll, at the end of the presentation, I'll, I'll give you a link to the traffic calming webpage if you're not familiar with it already. And there you will find a link to all the recordings for our traffic calming meetings all over the city. And this one will be posted on there probably early part of next week. If I had to guess, it'll be available to you. Uh, I think that's it. I think we're ready to get started. I saw council member Vo uh, uh, log in. And if uh, council member, if there's anything you'd like to say, we always like to we give you an opportunity if you'd like to address anyone. Thank you so much. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm very excited that you all are here. Um, thanks, um, Jeff, for leading this. But uh, looking forward to your feedback and making sure that um, the traffic calming you all want to see um, can happen. So thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, council member. And uh, yeah, as you mentioned, that's that's the real point of everyone gathering this morning. We would like to get your take on what we have to say and uh, your feedback on, on the things we're going to present to you. I'm going to, I'm going to, um, I'm going to turn my camera off at this time again, just to try and keep the, the memory a little bit lower. And um, I'm going to, I'm going to cover three major topics this morning. We're going to give you a little bit of background on the program and how Vox got inducted into the traffic calming program. Secondly, I'm going to share with you some of the tools that we have at our disposal uh, within the program. And then, and then probably most importantly, I want to show you the plan and, like we said, get your feedback to it and then talk about some next steps uh, beyond that. So uh, with that, we'll, we will get started here. Um, traffic calming, you, you're probably aware that, the, you know, the more projects that we roll out, uh, people are becoming more and more familiar with the program and what it offers. Uh, it is uh, a residential program. We really focus on uh, uh, residential streets where we know that speeding in these neighborhoods is a real quality of life issue as well as a safety issue. Uh, that is to say we don't do traffic calming in, in commercial areas by and large or industrial areas and things like that. We really focus on where people live. Uh, we do we do strive to implement physical solutions. We will have some educational type tools. I'll show you uh, one or two of those, but we have found that nothing slows traffic down quite as effectively as putting something in the road, whether it's a speed cushion or a, or one of those plastic sticks. We, we call them delineators, you know, things that you have to avoid or drive over and thereby lower your speed as a motorist. That seems to be the most effective way to do that. And we do focus on speed reduction. That's as opposed to trying to divert traffic to some other place. Uh, in most cases, we're not trying to do that and push traffic on some other street. Uh, we're just trying to keep traffic where it is, but slow it down and help it to drive through these neighborhoods a little more responsibly. That's the, the focus of our program. Uh, we do understand that this is one component. We are the engineering component of this. That is, we try to affect a positive change within the right of way. That's largely the job of the, the Nashville DOT. But we do have great partners on the enforcement side. We, we work with MNPD. Uh, they are very aware of the program, supporters of the program. Uh, and, and we know uh, that enforcement's a, a great tool, but not one that we can really rely on as a, a first deterrent against speeding. And that's because uh, as, as you all are very aware, MNPD is out there doing very important work and, and for them to prioritize traffic enforcement, it just always can't happen. They, they just don't have the resources often to dedicate to that in the way we might like it, but uh, but we work very closely with them and, and we hope that by doing some engineering changes, these can be kind of self-enforcing. Uh, it's kind of like a policeman out there around the clock, uh, making sure that traffic is operating in a safe way. And then, as I mentioned, there's some, there's some education component as well, uh, making sure people are aware of the speed limit, aware of what their speed is in regard to the speed limit. Um, the, the impact of speed in their neighborhoods can often be a, an effective message. And so we, we partner uh, generally within NDOT to get those educational type messages out. And this is an example of that. One thing we like to point out is the, uh, 
uh, the, the real devastating impact that speed can have in neighborhoods if, in the very unfortunate instance, there is a pedestrian and car crash. Uh, the, the lower speeds are uh, on the motorist side, uh, exponentially, the higher the uh, chance is that a pedestrian is going to survive a, a, a crash uh, if there happens to be one. So this, this is good information, just kind of reinforcing that. Uh, that speed really becomes a, a safety issue, especially when we're talking about uh, other non-drivers, pedestrians, bicyclists, transit users, of which you all have a, a, a whole lot uh, on Box Lane. We're very aware, and that's why one reason why that sidewalk project is is uh, is going as as difficult as it is. We we understand how important it is to accommodate different modes of travel. The uh, Traffic Common Program continues to be incredibly popular. Uh, we, in, in this last cohort of, of applications that we took in back in the summer of last year, we had over 500 streets, just like Volks Lane, that said, you know, we could really use some help uh, with this issue. Uh, and that is to say, um, you're not alone out there. This, these requests come in from every corner of the county, rural, urban, urban suburban, uh, and, and uh, and continue to come in in, in uh, numbers that we really just don't have resources to serve all of those. Uh, this latest um, this latest selection period uh, actually got 85 of those requests uh, answered, which is a, a big increase. There were some surplus funds and, and council uh, saw the, the benefit of this program and, and the demand that was out there in these neighborhoods and decided to uh, allocate some of those funds uh, to do some additional projects. And so streets like Volks benefited from that. And we appreciate council's support uh, in the program and, and uh, offering that. So continues to be a very uh, popular program that Metro performs, but there are others. And we always like to plug Hub Nashville as well. Uh, it's a great resource if you have questions, concerns, requests of your local government. Uh, this is a, just a tremendous resource if you're not familiar with it. Hub.nashville.gov. You can log on to that and you'll find a whole host of options, not just in NDOT, uh, but pretty much every metro department is represented there and, and uh, allows you to make um, requests for service uh, within your neighborhood. You can also pick up the phone, call 311, and that is staff uh, general work hours Monday through Friday. You can just talk to someone. We also like to mention that because there are tools sometimes that come up in these meetings um, having to do with stop signs or sidewalks, those types of things that we just can't offer in this program. Uh, but Hub Nashville is, is the way to, to make that request. You can get in there and log into that anytime you can upload pictures, you can pinpoint your requests on a map, and, and the people there will get those requests to the appropriate Metro staff person, make sure you get a response, and uh, you can satisfy those things that way. So back to Volks Lane and how uh, it got inducted into the program. Um, obviously, with 500 requests coming in, twice a year, uh, generally, um, we can't service all of those. And so we rely on a prioritization process to try and weed through all of that and find out what are the most pressing issues uh, across Davidson County. Um, and so we use a, a process that you just kind of summarized here to do that. Uh, we collect data. And so everything that we do is not just on a, on a hunch. We actually collect the data back up and have a, a uh, a ranked list of streets uh, relative to the traffic calming criteria that we've set for. And you see those here. About 70% of the score is based on um, car-oriented data that you would probably expect. It's how fast is traffic going and how much traffic is there on the street. That's the volume that you see, the number of cars. Uh, and then the speed of traffic is 45% of that. So 70% have to do with the vehicle. The other 30% have to do with uh, some of those non-vehicular users that we were talking about, pedestrians, bicyclists, et cetera. So 15% of that has to do with, is there, has there been a documented instance of a, of a pedestrian or bicyclist crash uh, on the street? We also look at, are there non-driver accommodations? For instance, if, if sidewalks are missing, 
you go up in the prioritization list, you get ranked higher. Uh, and, and so that's, that's how we accommodate for the fact that, uh, you know, speeds may be high, but on some of these streets, they have sidewalks. So at least a person has a place to walk. And so that's how we kind of uh, justify um, the scoring in that category. And then 5% have to do with destinations. Are there places in the area that people would be encouraged to walk or may want to make a walking trip like a school? or a park or transit stops, those types of things also drive the score up uh, a little bit higher. So we roll all of that information together, come up with a composite score, rank those, and that's generally how uh, these, these projects have been selected. So fortunately or, or unfortunately, uh, Box Lane was uh, among the top of those and, and has moved forward in the, in the traffic calming program. Here's some of the data uh, specific to the street uh, that we collected. So this project, I'll show you this on a map here on the next slide, but it, it goes the entire length of Volks from Ninth Avenue uh, uh, down to Gale Lane on its south end. And the data that we collected in that period, which I think was done before the sidewalk project began, I know all of that construction there has really uh, probably slowed traffic down um, uh, as that has progressed, but uh, traffic, the speed, 85th percentile speed is what we call it. It's kind of a statistical way we look at speed uh, across all different uh, streets that we collected on. 32 miles an hour, not one of the highest streets we've seen by any, any means. It's probably on, you know, in the lower half of the streets we do traffic calming on. So that's good news. It's not, it's not terribly fast. But you do have about 1,600 vehicles per day. That often sounds like a lot to people. It is a lot, but um, it, it doesn't concern us. We will do, we will do a typical kind of um, standard traffic calming using speed cushions and things up to uh, streets that have up to uh, 5,000 cars a day. So we're well within our uh, thresholds for uh, deploying these types of measures on the street. And it is a, a pretty narrow street, um, it's something around 20 to 22 feet. I haven't been out on the street and taken detailed measurements, but we can tell uh, from our desktop review, that's about what we're working with. That's, that's a pretty narrow street, not abnormally narrow, but uh, uh, which is actually a good thing when it comes to traffic calming. Often we're working with streets that may be 30 or 34 feet wide and uh, it just looks like a racetrack on some of these uh, streets. And so the fact that it's narrower actually works to our advantage uh, in this case. And then it's about seven tenths of a mile long, uh, pretty, pretty standard, maybe, a, maybe a slightly longer than our average traffic calming project. And you see Vox Lane here. Now, the, I know the, the labels are a little bit small, but uh, Vox is the, the north south, generally north south street. Um, kind of uh, in the center or just to the right of the center of the street. Um, it is green, you see that green line, and then you see some other color lines. Let me explain those uh, briefly. This is, a, this is a map, it is an interactive map uh, that can be found on NDOT's traffic calming website. And it allows you to pan all over the county and see all the different traffic calming uh, projects uh, in, in Metro. The, the colors mean that, uh, green color means that there is a traffic calming project that has been selected, it's funded, it is uh, somewhere in the works. It may have just been selected, or it may be you just waiting for the contractor to get out there and, and install uh, the devices. So somewhere in, the, in, the, in progress is a traffic calming project. You see one there on Clayton, uh, there's a couple others uh, in the area. The purple lines uh, indicate that there is an application in on a project, but it has not been yet selected. And so that may be important if you're driving around or walking around and you see a street and wonder, you know, would this be a traffic calming street? Uh, if, uh, if it's on this map, it's already been applied for, you don't need to apply for it again. And then the blue ones, especially the blue dashed ones, indicate that there is a, a traffic calming project that has already been installed. And that may be important if you're not familiar with the types of work that we do, you can, you can go there and drive that, experience that, and see what you think about it. Uh, I think you all are, are probably um, probably familiar. I know some, some speed humps were just installed there on Leland in front of Severe Park. Some things I think have recently been installed on portions of Gale Lane. 
So anyway, there is there's other um, devices around you, uh, but um, this map gives you some indication about where you might go see that. All right, a little bit about some of the tools that we have and, and use most frequently, and and this is this is uh, tool number one for us, and it and it has become almost the exclusive tool that we use. Speed cushions, um, you see them popping up on streets um, pretty frequently now. Uh, you know, I guess probably 95 plus percent of our projects are exclusively speed cushion projects. And that's really for good reason. One is they're, they're very uh, consistent. When we order these, these are a manufactured device, three cycled rubber, compressed, really high density. They make it in a factory. And so when they ship it to us, we know exactly what we're getting. We know the, the profile is the same, how we place them is the same. And that's helpful for motorists as you drive around in different neighborhoods, you're always encountering the same device. For years, these things were, were formed on site by a contractor and some of them may have been a little higher and some of them may have been a little longer. And so you, you never knew what you were gonna get when you drove across one of these, but we really like the consistency of, of the manufactured speed cushions. Um, it's only about three inches tall, but most people will tell you that's that's enough to affect a positive change uh, in speeds. And so um, they come in, in six foot wide, I guess they call them cushions because they're like little pillows you put out and they, they're six feet wide, which is wide enough that, that cars cannot straddle these. Uh, you will have to put two wheels at least uh, on these. Um, but they they have these brakes in them because some vehicles we want to be impacted less than others we want to slow down private cars we don't necessarily want to have as much of an impact on things like ambulances and fire trucks and so forth and so this broken aspect to them allows those emergency vehicles to um, uh, have a little bit less impact as they get to where they need to go um, and that's six foot wide uh, 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 width allows them to come a little bit closer to straddling. Uh, you see some different configurations there. You see two of them side by side. Sometimes you see three. I think we've installed up to about five feet wide. Sometimes streets are that wide. And, and that's the real point here is we want to make sure that the entire width of the road is covered, not literally edge to edge of the pavement, but uh, enough so that someone cannot drive around these. Uh, and, and we, we know from experience, unfortunately, people will do that. Uh, there, some people will go to great lengths to try and drive around them. So uh, we're aware of that. And, and in our design, we, we can put some measures out there to make sure that doesn't happen. Sometimes we'll do that using the, the big steel street sign that you see in the upper left-hand corner, that yellow sign. Sometimes we'll do that with the flexible delineators that you see in the bottom right-hand picture. Uh, all of those things are designed to keep people from uh, driving around our, our speed cushion locations. We can also vary the, the length of them. Uh, that is in the direction of, of traffic. So uh, the shortest ones that are offered are seven feet. We have begun reserving those from some for some of our most urban neighborhoods. Uh, they are the most aggressive, just meaning they will typically slow traffic down to the slowest speeds, somewhere around 15 miles an hour. Uh, the standard that we have begun using, the, the kind of default go-to is the 10 and a half foot cushion. You see that one in the in the bottom left-hand picture. Uh, it's got a one ramped up section, one flat section, and then one ramped down section. Uh, that's a little less aggressive. We try to target, you know, a 20, 22 miles an hour with something like that. And then we can add another flat piece in the middle and stretch that out to a 14 foot uh, section. We typically have been reserving those for um, more of our rural areas where, uh, you know, you just got more wide open spaces and maybe it's signed at 30 miles an hour. We're not looking for such an aggressive uh, lowering of speeds there. So we have a little bit of design flexibility with, with these cushions. And I'll show you the plan uh, that we have for folks in just a second. Another tool that we have kind of a, a close cousin to the speed cushion is the speed table. Same manufacturer, same uh, material that's used. Uh, these are all durable and they're holding up really well for us. But the speed table is just a little bit different configuration. You see the, 
the uh, obvious difference here is that it goes all the way across the street. We have begun using these very, very sparingly. Uh, I think Parks has been putting some in um, uh, some of their park locations. Those there on uh, Leland Lane are speed tables, but that is that is uh, a rarity. Uh, we because we really like to keep that emergency vehicle uh, consideration uh, when we're when we're putting these out. So we do use them, uh, but. Uh, uh, just not nearly as often. Otherwise, it's pretty much the same, same three height, uh, just a little bit different configuration. We do have some before and after data on these. Most people, if you drive a street before we put cushions and after, it's pretty obvious, you know, what, what happens. Um, but we do have a little bit of before and after data. Some of that's still being collected, but we're seeing on average streets coming down uh, the speed coming down to you know about nine to twelve miles an hour, something like that. But it it really varies. You guys are already, as we mentioned, a, a, a kind of on the slower end uh, of the spectrum. So we may not expect such a drastic change. But uh, in any case, our our target is to get speed that back down to uh, around 20, 25 miles an hour, the posted speed limit on most of our streets. We do have, uh, this is one of those educational tools we mentioned. Uh, it's the radar feedback sign. Pretty well does what it says it does. It uh, shows you the speed limit and then shows you your speed as you're, as you're coming down the street. Um, we'll use these uh, in, in cases where um, maybe the speed limit is, is uh, higher, like 35 miles an hour. Maybe the street has more than 5,000 cars a day, like we mentioned was the threshold. And then sometimes within a, a uh, otherwise traditional traffic calming project, maybe there's a real steep hill, maybe there's a real sharp curve, things like that where we, we are not going to put a, a speed cushion. Sometimes we'll supplement if there's a big gap in speed cushions, we might supplement with a, a feedback sign just to continue to remind people you're still in a, in a traffic calmed area and you need to watch your speed. So it, it, it's, it's a good tool. Um, jury is still out. Uh, really on the effectiveness of these, especially in the long term. We know when we first put them out, we get a really good six, seven mile uh, speed reduction on average. Uh, but we're still, you know, kind of compiling some of that information to see how does that hold up uh, over the long, over the long. Another tool that we have that is uh, uh, not a vertical measure like a, a speed cushion is narrowing the pavement. We know that if Visually, the road looks really wide. That tends to encourage speeding. Um, and so sometimes we can visually narrow the street to try and um, uh, communicate that it is a narrower street and slower speeds are more appropriate. We have to be careful, though. Uh, this picture here kind of shows the aspect of if, if we were to put a, a double solid yellow line on some streets, it, it might communicate that it is a more major street than it is. And, speed higher speed is is expected and that's certainly not what we want to communicate so we we do this carefully we don't do it very often but occasionally we'll we'll put some striping some edge lines or some center lines on the street if we think that'll help the project and then when we have uh bigger wider streets that that uh you know really have um, some width issues we might do uh some other types of tools like these bulb outs is the picture on the left where we have an intersection that's really wide and people are you know, kind of whipping around those corners fast because there's just a lot of room to do that. We will try to narrow those up. We typically do that with, with both paint and some of those delineators. Uh, the paint tends to get ignored if you don't, if you don't put something there that's going to, again, physically uh, uh, discourage somebody from, from doing that. And then chicanes are a, a way to really meander traffic back and forth. Uh, it works best if it's done in concert with something like on street park and there's a couple of streets in nashville that have this not very many and it's not something we uh, introduce very often and then traffic circles one that uh again has has some mixed experience here there you'll you will see streets and you'll see streets very close to you that uh, do have some traffic circles uh we, we're not using those very often at the moment largely because when when these go in there's uh, generally some some uh, consequences in terms of school buses and some other large vehicles that, that might have problems navigating the, 
things. And, and you got to have an awful lot of pavement to put something like this and then make it clear about how traffic should use it and they can use it effectively. It just takes some very large intersections. So again, we don't use these very often, but we do keep them in the, in the toolbox. I've done a lot of talking here and I'm, and I want to, and I want to hear from you and, and here's, here's what I want to show you. Uh, this is, this is your project. This is Vox Lane. Let me kind of, I know this might be hard to read depending on your, your setup there at home, but, uh, on the left hand side of the page is, uh, you see that very far left stop sign that's at Gale Lane. And then the purple line is outlining Vaux, and then you hopefully can see some of the st side streets there, Clayton Avenue. The always stop there at uh, at Kirkwood. You see those two stop signs. The stop signs, by the way, just indicate that there is a stop on Vaux Lane. Okay, so um, as you're driving uh, from Gale Lane toward Ninth, you're going to stop at Kirkwood, then you keep going, and you're going to stop again at Inverness, Montrose, uh, there, and then keep going, and, and then you're going to kind of free flow there on to Ninth. And so uh, that's the layout of the street. Um, the way, in, and then you see, you see six locations of Speed Cushions plant. The way we arrive at that is, we look at these distances. So the first one we would look at is the distance between the stop at Gale and the stop at Kirkwood. We see that that's just a little over 1200 feet. And then we divide that by what we'd like the spacing to be for these speed cushions. We know that if we can get somewhere in that three to 500 foot spacing range, uh, that's gonna work well for us. Um, it's close enough together that people don't drive over a set of speed cushions and then step on the gas and, and go fast just to get to the next one. It's close enough you don't want to do that. It doesn't make a lot of sense because as soon as you get over the, the first one, you can kind of see the next one and it doesn't make sense to speed up a whole lot. Um, but it's not so close together that it becomes obnoxious and begins putting traffic on uh, other, other streets. So we've really found that to be kind of the sweet spot. If we can be somewhere around 400 feet spacing, that's a good thing. Uh, the other thing that we look at, and again, in the, in by the time we get to this this meeting, we've not looked at this in in as much detail as we will. And that is, are there steep hills? Are there sharp curves? And and those kinds of things. And one that really might come to bear on this project, are there driveways that are just really close together? One of our um, policies, I guess you'd say, is that. We really strive to keep these as, as far away from driveways as we can, but um, it, it, as much as possible, we will really work hard to stay at least 15 feet away from any driveway. And that, that becomes difficult, you know, in, as we get into more urban areas where driveways are really close together. And there are some segments of Vox where that's the case. And so I like to give a little caveat here that, um, you know, we think the spacing that you're seeing here will work. That is two sets of speed cushions in between each of these stop locations. But until we get out on the street and kind of look at, uh, I know some people have driveways, some people have built kind of those little pull offs where you, you park on the side of the street. We know all of those kinds of things exist. So uh, until we get out and, and actually walk the street, and get some of those measurements, we may uh, adjust this slightly. But going into it, we think this is this is the plan um, that will give us a, a good result, uh, of slower speeds on vaults from, from Gale to Nine. So with that, um, I, I'd like to hear some feedback if you have it. Is this what you expect? Is it not? Do you like it? Do you not? What have we missed? Feel free to unmute and, and give us your thoughts. Hey, Jeff, thanks for your help. But uh, I live on the part of Vox where no matter how much I pay in taxes, the city has determined they can't build a sidewalk, which is frustrating. I'm happy for the sidewalk we have. It's changed my life. Thank you. Uh, you said basically 95% of the time you use speed cushions. That doesn't really help uh, walking on the section where I live, which is the part with no sidewalk. It sounded like there were no solutions in the toolbox that would help that. Uh, alleviate or at least create room what other solutions could there be to help solve walking down box because for me it's frustrating it doesn't help solve the major problem which is it's not safe to walk on our section of the street 
and going to my office back and forth, I'm going to hit 25 to 35 speed bumps every day. Just, just going to my office back and forth. Yeah. Well, um, you're, well, you're absolutely right. There's, there's nothing that will, um, uh, help lack of a sidewalk quite like building a sidewalk. <laughs> and, and there's, there's not a quick way to do that as, as we've seen on, on, uh, the, the portion of Vox that is getting the sidewalk. I, I, I did not look at this, but my recollection is there is at least loosely, I don't know how, how firm it is, a plan to extend that and continue building sidewalks on vaults. I, I, I seem to remember the one that is being built is a phase, uh, and, and maybe there are other phases, but but I, I'm not going to commit to you on that, but just because I, I didn't do a lot of homework on that. Um, um, I, I would not quite go so far as to say this doesn't do anything to help that. Um, I, what, we, what we often find is that... Um, We'll come to these meetings and, and people will talk about this issue, which is incredibly important. We know it's top of mind and probably the most important thing we could do to the street, build a sidewalk. Um, this is, uh, you know, maybe a help. We, we understand it's not a complete fix to that problem by any means, but we do think that it, it, it helps some. And so people will come and they'll say, you know, we need a sidewalk or we've got sight distance issues or we've got pedestrian crossing issues can we get a crosswalk here and, and that's what they're really looking for when they when they come to traffic calming and we don't often offer the the uh the fix that they might like to see in that but we will say once speed cushions go in and if we see that average speed decrease it does begin to feel a little bit like a different street so you may find that i i do feel a little bit safer walking on the street certainly than i do now i know it's not perfect but um it does just, feel a little just to better. summarize what i hear you saying is it may help we really don't have the tool like what about one-way streets i'm not advocating for one-way streets it would be a dramatic change but you haven't even mentioned that you know like yeah, we don't we don't do one way streets as this as as part of this program. Uh, the gotcha. So that I, somebody else's program. Yeah, uh, yeah. If you want to if you want to request a one way street again or or sidewalks those types of things that hub in the website is is where you would do that. So there's really no benefit. It will slow cars down, but for the part of Vox with no sidewalk, we can't. There's nothing really we can do to benefit other than wait. For a sidewalk, I think that's largely right. Yeah, I mean, I, I yeah. yeah, it'll slow traffic down. I'm not gonna. This doesn't widen the road. It doesn't provide any space to walk. We those are just cost tools that are out of the the uh, ability of this program. That's right. Would it? Excuse me, but would it be possible to um, use the street narrowing approach in the areas where there are not sidewalks? So specifically between in Vernus and Hillview Heights, uh, we walk to school every day, and I just that area is just very um, narrow, and there's really nowhere to walk. I'm wondering if painting the the um, white lines at least would help, and if that's possible. Yeah, it, it, it's possible. Um, again, it gets back to the the width of of the street that's out there. Um, I, I don't know exactly what the width of the street is right there, but it's probably, again, in that range of, of 20, 22 feet. The minimum lane width that Metro would use is, is 10 feet. That's what has been put uh, on 10th Avenue and some of the, you know, the, the bikeway projects that have come into the neighborhood and those kind of things. That's a that's a 10 foot lane. It's kind of the, the minimum standard that they will use. So if it's a 20 foot edge of pavement to edge of pavement width, there, there is no narrowing that can be done. Even if it's 22, typically, you know, you, you could stripe, I suppose, a one lane shoulder on each side of the road, but it's not going to feel like I've got a place to walk. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's going to just sort of be a, a, an edge of pavement that's one foot beyond the, the fog line, which may be, may be helpful. I, I don't know, but it, I, I don't want to give you the indication that it's going to, you know, be a true place to walk which i understand is frustrating but uh, it's, we're kind of limited by the the width of the pavement that's out there if if it's wider than that uh certainly it's something we can look at doing and you know uh, may be helpful but we'll certainly take that into consideration as we get out and, and uh, develop this further on on the street 
May I ask, is there um, any data to support? I understand that it's going to slow traffic down, but is there any data that supports a reduction in use of the street itself? Um, I'm in the section right next to Scott, kind of right where a speed cushion looks like it might be going in. And about three weeks ago, we had someone who completely took out our entire front fence. Um, and I you know, can't say whether or not that was speed related. I think there was probably some sort of alcohol involved, but the usage of Vox feels like a bypass you know, to 8th. And I'm just curious if these kinds of traffic calming um, you know, solutions, does that help to mitigate the traffic that actually winds up using that street in the end? Is there any data around that? That's a good question. We don't have any data that, that would speak to that. And, and even if we did, I would say that, you know, every street situation is a little different. And it's really hard to guess when speed cushions go in, does it push traffic to some other street? In some neighborhoods, we've got anecdotal evidence, at least, that says, yes, it does. I mean, we, we go into some neighborhoods that have gotten inducted into the program. I'm thinking one in particular over on Harding Place that, uh, or, or, uh, or Battery Lane uh, over there, that uh, the city of Oak Hill put speed cushions on their street. And they'll say it absolutely had an impact on our street because now we're seeing faster speeds and more cars than we did before they did that. And I, and I believe them. Uh, I believe that's true. Mm -hmm. But it's hard to guess that, um, you know, when these go in, they will push traffic. Again, that's not our intent because we're really not trying to push traffic. Now, if, if somehow we could figure out how we could keep them on 8th Avenue or keep them on a higher classification road where they where it should be, that'd be great. But that's that's the kind of a long ways away. And that's that's difficult to do uh, as part of these projects. So, again, our focus is to really slow traffic down whatever the volumes are it, it may push traffic off of the street it may not uh but but that's that's not our objective uh, really so is there program. i'm just curious then so are, are after these kinds of um you know speed cushions and things go in is there less um monitoring of the street i guess i'm i'm naive to to how this process began and how kind of it's you know was determined that vox needed this um you know, traffic calming, but so once those speed cushions go in, are we not monitoring the traffic that's happening on that street as frequently, or how do we know if the speed cushions are working? And I guess I, that was my question about, like, there's their data there that, you know, you can extrapolate from about the amount of people traveling on Vox afterwards. Yeah, that's that's great. I, I, um, I, I have to say that, that yeah, there's, there's less monitoring. So the way the, the program works is someone has applied for traffic calming on the street, uh, that gets rolled into all of the other requests that have been made. And about twice a year, we will take all those requests and go out there and put tubes across the road. You know, sometimes you're driving on the street, you run over those two little black tubes. That's collecting the amount of traffic and the speed on the street. Um, at that point, we, we can say, okay, we've got data. We know how fast and how much traffic there is on the street. That rolls into, the, into our prioritization. If the street gets selected, as Vox has, it, we kind of we don't do much more data collection. We'll come to you and say, here's what here's our thoughts about how to slow traffic down on the street. Um, I know we've got limited tools, but it's the tools that we've got. Uh, we'll, we're going to talk about, you know, um, how to how to vote for that and whether the street as a whole thinks it's a good idea or not. At that point, we don't typically come back out and do a lot of follow up investigation as an engineer. I would love to do that, but we're, you know, we've got 499 more streets asking for this. And so Metro's resources are really geared towards helping as, as many people as we can broadly and not necessarily following up and seeing. That's not to say certainly the city walks away if there are issues or there are concerns that have come about as part of the traffic calming project. You know, we would look at those, but uh, we we don't have many of those. I mean, these projects go out and they kind of do what we intend them to do by and large, and uh, we move on to the next one. So, unfortunately, there's not a lot of follow up. I have a I have a comment about the um, when you go down Gale and you turn on Vox and you go to the four way stop. I know people kind of cut through there because if you keep on Gale and you want to turn left on 8th, it's almost impossible, you know, at certain times of the day. And they may be using that as a cut through. And um, so I don't know if they've ever considered putting a traffic light on 8th, you know, where Gale comes out at, at that Gale, intersection. Yeah. 
No, I, I think you're on to something. I, I certainly think that's a possibility because you do have a, a signal there at Kirkwood. And so anytime a traffic signal is, is somewhere, especially on a street like eight, it kind of becomes a magnet for traffic, you know, because, you know, I, I can get out. I can get out safely. It's dependable. Whereas Gail, I, I may be able to get out and I may just uh, get into the Chick-fil-A uh, mess down there. So, yeah, it's uh, I think you're right. <laughs> Jeff, uh, did you say a minute ago that there had been a chance for us to um, in some way vote on this, that the neighbors uh, affected have had input? This is the first I'd heard about our chance to have input, or has there been something that I'd missed? Yeah, no, you absolutely do. Let me uh, let me go ahead and, and progress through these slides, but in no way am I moving away from this. Be glad to come back and, and talk more about the uh, the plan here. But Well, I definitely have a, a longer comment about okay. the plan, uh, okay. if you, you can tell me when the appropriate time is. Sure, I'll, I'll go ahead and address the, the, the input and, and voting right. process. So this is where we are at the at the red circle here. This is just a little background on the process. Um, we're at the, the neighborhood meeting. After this meeting, if it sounds like we're, we're on the right track, we'll move into design yeah, either way. Or if, you, if we come back to that plan and say, now can we look at this or that or change things? We will do that and we'll, we'll go into the design after this. At that point, we've got a decision to make, uh, and, and we love to have feedback at this meeting as to whether you think that's uh, possible. If you think we're on the right track, we may not need a second meeting. Okay, so you see sort of an optional second neighborhood meeting down here. We used to do it on every project, but to try and expedite some of these, we've, we've made that optional to the neighborhood. Um, so we can come back together, or if you think we're close enough, we don't need to, that's fine too. In any case, after the design, that will be made available online. You'll have access to a much more detailed set of drawings than what I just showed you. And uh, and then you'll be given the opportunity to vote on it. So this online ballot process is, uh, is, is how we uh, make sure that everyone on the neighborhood has had an opportunity to learn about the project and, and give us their thoughts about whether it's, it, it's something for your street or not. And um, so what we will do is, We'll send out these cards. Um, it, hopefully you got a card for this meeting. If, if you are a property owner on the street, um, if you got a card for this meeting, you get a, a, a ballot card as well later in this process. And um, you'll, you'll go to a, a specific website and give us your name and address and you know, certify that you own the property and you will vote yes or no on the project. That stays open for six weeks. And at the end of that process, we take all those votes. And if two thirds of the people have voted in favor of it, we will do the project as it's been designed with speed cushions or, or whatever we end up with. If, if not, uh, we will come back and, and typically try to do something of a less aggressive type of a, a measure. Maybe it's the feedback signs or something like that, just some signage. And, uh, and proceed that way. So yeah, in that way, everybody has an opportunity to vote for it. And we do, we do uh, look again, two thirds of the people to vote in favor of it. Does that answer the question about- Very much so, very clear, process? thank you, yeah. yeah. And I do have a little more information about who gets to vote. Uh, you know, we can show you that if you're interested, but right. generally if you own property abutting the street. Well, I just wanted to join this morning uh, to express a point of view. I don't know how prominent it is. Your your take on this has been, you know, you see this from a solutions uh, place, and I respect that. And um, all of the rhetoric that you've offered about uh, speed control, traffic calming, has been uh, positive. And I, I I have seen what this proposal. Um, as kind of a solution in search of a problem. Uh, this has always struck me as a pretty calm street. Uh, but the bigger issue that I'd like to raise is that uh, we've been here 15 years, and in all that time, it's the street, Box Lane between us and Ninth, and um, mainly, has really been quite the obstacle course because it's been one of the most heavily constructed uh, streets, rebuilt streets in the in the city. The res the, the the houses have have gone up by the by the dozens. So that's been you know that's slowed us, our, slowed our 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 role as it were on uh, just getting in the neighborhood. But then of course the last two years. With the uh, sidewalk construction and the the uh, trenching, um, it's this street's been an obstacle course and at, at times a really annoying one. Uh, steel plates. Uh, by my wife and I have both lost a tire uh, respectively to um, to the steel plates at one point or another. 
Uh, there's been ruts, there's been holes. It has been a really jarring, annoying uh, drive just to get either to Kirkwood or to uh, to Ninth. Now, respect the work that's being done. The sidewalks are fantastic, glad to have them. But just when we could start to dream of unobstructed, smooth roads, the first ones in many, many years, uh, then comes the, the news of this uh, proposal, which would on purpose put obstacle courses in the street. Between Kirkwood and Inverness is a rather short stretch. The four-way stop that went in at Inverness a few years ago, uh, good idea. And that is a traffic calming device if ever there was one. There's not really space between Inverness and Kirkwood to um, rev your engine and roar up to a, uh, you know, some kind of dangerous speed. I would probably count on one hand the number of times in all the years walking on, on Vox that I have thought, hey, man, that is a, a dangerous driving, that I've seen somebody actually really speeding and being heedless. Um, and uh, I really just, my wife and I just don't want to see these go in. Um, there is, uh, we're, it's a short stretch, and uh, these bumps are, uh, they, they seem designed to me, the ones that I've seen on, on Gale, for example, and up, up in closer to Belmont, in the, uh, around Belmont, um, they're kind of designed as if everybody has an SUV. They, you, you can go over them at 10, 12 miles an hour, 15 miles an hour if you have a, a large vehicle. I don't, and uh, I have to slow down to about seven, six, seven, eight miles an hour to go over it without being pretty jarring. They're designed so that I have to put one wheel over so that it's, it twists you. It's just really annoying. And the idea of going over four of them between here and Douglas, uh, which is a road I drive uh, virtually every day, it's pretty annoying. So I'll be voting no. And uh, uh, maybe I've, I just want to share my, share my take. Cause uh, I don't, I don't see, I think, especially now the pedestrians can be on those sidewalks. We, we do not, I do not look out there and see an unsafe street. It's going to be great once this is all done. Thanks. Um, this is Bernadette Welch. Um, I, I just want to give some backstory for those of you who haven't been here as long as I have. Um, I bought my house 31 years ago. I live at the corner of Volks Lane and Inverness. And um, five years ago, we had a neighborhood meeting and we wanted traffic calming. And I will just for context, there were no four way stops. There was no sidewalk <laughs> and it, it was a race strip. And so Chris Myers and I got together and we put this application in in 2019. So the application has rolled year after year after year. And in the interim, because of other issues that we've had, like serious wrecks where people were almost killed, we've gotten the four-way stops put in. And then we got the sidewalk, part of the sidewalk put in. I know it's not what everybody wants, but it, it's a start. And so this is the last phase of the traffic calming application that was submitted in 2019. Um, you know, I'm not going to advocate for one position or the other. I'm just trying to give you history of how we got where we were. But in my experience, the four way stop, it took me years to get that put in at, at Volks and Inverness. I've witnessed accident after accident after accident. People are still running the four way stops. Um, they're helpful. They do slow most people down, but there are people that just zip right through them. And so, um, so I would not say that this is always a safe street. In fact, I don't walk down Vox Lane because I, I don't find it to, to be safe. I've almost been hit a couple of times, but that's just my personal experience. But the history of how we got to where we are today started back in 2019. And, and so that's where we're coming from. Um, I, I guess I'll jump in because Bernadette just, just, just called me by name. Bernadette, good to see you. Um, good to see all, all these neighbors on here. Uh, I, I'm just going to speak from the perspective of somebody who's at the other end. Um, I'm I'm near ninth. That that kind of crazy, crazy looking intersection. Um, I walk my kids to school every day, as do many of my neighbors or people coming down Hillview Heights. Uh, specifically at that time in the morning, when there's a school zone um, up on 10th. I think a, a lot of traffic gets diverted. You know, we're talking about overall volume over the course of the day. I'd be willing to bet that most of that volume happens in a more compacted um, time frame when when tents becomes less accessible because you know there's a backup in front of the school. Um, and when you've got additional um, 
traffic on eight. And this is before, remember on eight, we've got two different drive throughs going in across the street from each other right before the Wedgwood intersection, which I suspect is gonna have a heavier impact on driving traffic up. Um, I'm actually most concerned about the, the cross, I know you don't do crosswalks and that's, that's completely fine. Um, but that intersection at ninth and, and Volks, the, the actual street addresses go a little bit farther than that purple line we see below. They go through that Wald Kirch intersection. You still got Volks addresses to the end of the, um, the Wald Kirch intersection over there. I, it, it's really tough for a kid to cross that street because you've got traffic coming full speed off of nine, right? There's no, there's no stop sign at that intersection. Um, you've got cars pointed in different directions, right? Coming coming off of ninth towards the rest of ninth. You've got cars cornering there. If you actually go straight on ninth, the way the intersection is currently engineered, you've got a yield to cars that are making a left turn off of walks directly in front of you, which is just kind of crazy to me. Um, I wonder if there's anything that we can do to slow traffic down inside that intersection. I know you said you use traffic circles sparingly, and I understand why. Um, but I think that because that intersection is such an odd shape and there's there's traffic moving so quickly through it at the mouth of all to the beginning, it's, it's really tough. You've got a school right at the end of the street. And I mean, there's, there's dozens of children trying to cross there every morning. And, and it's, it's, it's kind of like an obstacle course or a frogger game for the kids too. So I, I don't know what can be done, but I would appreciate just taking that into consideration. Chris, I'm with you. We walked back from coffee this morning, and that's a, that's the worst intersection. Uh, Craig, I'm with you. Uh, I feel like I'm destroying my car, and I have an SUV. Um, and also, it's frustrating uh, when Jeff, you you mentioned there's really no evidence to show this works. Answered up, you know. Uh, so the stop sign was a big deal. I remember before we had that, it was a nice drag strip. You could really hit 50, and a lot of people did. Uh, with the sidewalk, I mean, other than the section we live on, it's dramatically different when you're walking now. Um, so I think it's overkill. I think it's going to be a very frustrating day in and out. Um, having the sidewalk we dreamed of, never having the sidewalk we dream of, but yet putting in six speed bumps, it's frustrating. I, I definitely won't support it. And I wish we would solve the problem in an innovative way. You know, like Chris is talking about, like, what are the actual problems now? We need another sidewalk. We need some crossing areas. Well, all that's really good input, really helpful. Appreciate the, the background. Appreciate, you know, some of the issues that you're dealing with now more specifically. Uh, the one thing that I hear there uh, in terms of that, uh, the problematic intersection up there at Ninth and Balks, uh, one, one thing I could offer was I, I, I've already, we typically already will cheat these a little bit out to the, the ends of each of these segments. In that case, I might do that a little bit more, scoot one of our cushions a little closer to the ninth intersection, just, you know, as you, as you round that corner and kind of make that funny turn there. Um, you know, move that first speed cushion in a little closer to that, as well as maybe some advanced warning signage that you're about to enter that that traffic calm section of the street um, so that that's helpful to hear i wish we had more ability in terms of, of crosswalks to kind of think through that a little bit and that's not to say we won't and we, we will take what we hear from these meetings back to NDOT staff uh, who are more responsible for uh, the crosswalks and those kinds of things they can look at that as part of this but we we just can't offer those as part of the the speed cushion um, layout itself. The speed cushions between um, Gale and Kirkwood, we would appreciate those cushions uh, because there is a lot of uh, traffic that just speeds up in that section. And um, I always been confused. When you come down, uh, there's a yield sign that uh, is at Ninth Avenue, where you know Vox goes off to the left, but there's a yield sign at the end of Ninth. I've never known what who's yielding to who. Does anybody know? 
Yeah, you're yielding. If you are going straight on ninth, you're yielding to a person making a left turn directly in front of you off of vault, which is what I said was, was part of the insanity of the design of that intersection. I yeah. would, is you mentioned traffic circles were sometimes used. And I just, because that intersection is so odd and there's so many points coming in and out from different directions, I actually wonder if it would be helpful even just like a little bollard circle to be able to direct, because then traffic would at least be moving in the, the same direction. And if you're trying to cross, you'd really, you'd, it would be predictable where, where traffic would be coming. It would automatically slow them down inside the intersection instead of, you know, 50, 50 feet down. Even, even something that was small, I think, could actually have a big impact on just, just slowing people down a little bit through that intersection. Yeah. Tell me if you're coming on bulks towards ninth, are you allowed? You know, it's it's a really bad skew there. Are you allowed to make a left? I know it's hard to do. Is there is there any re, is there any restriction to doing that? You are allowed to make a left off of bulks onto ninth, and in fact, have the right of way in front of cars that are driving straight onto ninth. Well, I'm um, okay. I'm I'm talking about say you're coming from Gale on bulks. Yes. And you can, you can make on box, making a left turn onto yeah. ninth. Yeah. You are actually the right of way. If there's a yield sign to people going straight on ninth, yeah. where they are supposed to yield to you making a left turn in front of them, but not if they're staying left on box, in which case they crash into the side of you and have the right of way. Okay, I'm off to take a look at that. That, that is, that is <laughs> that's confusing for me sitting here trying to understand it. <laughs> so I can imagine if you're driving. So, yeah, well. We'll take a look at that, but I, I I know it's it's probably been that way a, lo a really long time. But uh, hey, we, just, it was what? actually it was re-engineered that way maybe five years ago. That yield oh, okay. sign was put in when they tried to fix the intersection, and that's why I'm saying I I just think if you actually had people having to make those turns around a circle that just slowed them down a little bit, it would be I think it could actually be beneficial for cars and for people in some way, just because it would it would just take people down from from hitting the pedal coming down off a of ninth onto box towards Gale, yeah. which is where there, I think there is actually a speed problem there still, even though it's slowed down in, in, in other parts of the, the street. Okay. Well, we, we can certainly take a look at that. I, I, I want to, I want to be honest with you. I, I mean, we see a lot of these and we do a lot of requests and some, there's a lot of intersections. We go back to, to end and say, Hey, we, we think this really has some merit. Can you think we ought to try it here? It's, it's difficult to get, um, you, you know, some some approval to go forward with a lot of traffic circles, and so we've we've really backed into kind of doubling down on speed cushions. But but certainly we'll take a look at it, especially if it's something like a you know any kind of a conflict from signage or striping. But uh, uh, yeah, we'll we'll take that into consideration. Hey Jeff, this is this is Peter, um, and I live at the the base of uh, where Dewey's dead ends in the vaults. And we've been on the street for 11 years and uh, appreciate the sidewalk project. And I, I, I feel Scott's pain. We walk up his direction of the street and it gets narrow and it gets a little more challenging. So hopefully, you know, we can extend that in the future. But um, I think the challenge is that coming off of Kirkwood and also Ninth is the pitch of the road is that you got a pretty steep grade coming both ways. So people pick up a good bit of speed and we feel it quite a bit where we are on the street. So even if the, the cushions aren't the answer, um, I still think that there is a, you know, speed issue on our street. We've got three kids and uh, it, it can be a challenge, you know, to, to be outside out front when there are people going by about 50, 60 miles an hour clip. So uh, thank you all for taking your Saturday to meet with us and it's good to see all our neighbors on the call. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. I'm sorry to jump on again. Can I just, is Terry still on the call? I'm wondering if she can provide some context about the, the sidewalk extension, because I do think that it actually impacts what we should be thinking about for, for traffic. I mean, if there's a sidewalk going in, I think about all of these things differently, but having, I mean, I've been, I've been advocating back, back to the Sandra Moore days when we were told the sidewalk would be impossible on the street. Now we have half of it. My understanding is that, that it's very up in the air as to if there's even space to build the sidewalk the rest of it from Inverness up to the, the ninth connection and that there are trees and might not be the right way to do it. And if there's not, and if we're gonna have people and kids walking in the street as, as the only kind of permanent solution, I think that 
that should influence maybe our decision in some way about about what we're doing on that. And if if we're pretty confident that the sidewalks will come in at some point in time, I, I would I would think about the problem differently. Hi, Chris. Uh, what I'll need to do is go back and talk with NDOT about um, um, the street and, you know, like you said, if it's up in the air, just discussing and asking them what the plan is. Um, and I'm happy to get back to you all um, once I um, have a discussion with them. So I don't know today, um, but I'm happy, um, you know, to discuss that with them. And I, I hear what you all want. So um, I will follow up on that. And I'll add from a technical perspective, you know, sometimes we're asked, does this make a sidewalk any more or less likely? I don't want to speak to that. I would hope, I would hope it doesn't impact that decision, but um, I'm, I'm not going to say it, it doesn't. But what it, what it, I, I do like to point out another aspect to the speed cushions that we like is they're modular, they're bolt down. If, you know, these go in and six months later, the street needs to be repaved or something happens, there's a water main break, whatever. These can easily be taken up, moved around, put back down. So, you know, it, from a technical perspective, there's absolutely no reason why this going in in the short term should impact construction in the long term of a bigger of a bigger project like a sidewalk. Just keep that in mind. It's not a this is not a big capital outlay that once you put it in, it can't be changed. It can easily be taken up. Um, also along those lines, I guess, um, time, time frame, I, I showed you this slide a second ago, but I didn't point out um, uh, probably the, the one of the more important aspects to it. Once we get through the design and the ballot process, um, it, it, assuming the ballot were to pass, say we're still right now if things don't change and they're trying to, to speed this up. But at the moment, we're still a year away from any kind of cushions going in. So keep that in mind. The sidewalk is a very long term project. I'm aware of that. But ours doesn't happen overnight either. Uh, but but, you know relatively a year is a is a shorter duration but we're still that far away from anything happening i just i like to make sure uh, expectations are, are set on that as well any other thoughts on the the plan or what we've posed here um it it may be worth mentioning, Jeff, just to clarify, these don't take a year to, to build the actual time that they're being constructed is only about a week. Yeah, good good point, David. So it, uh, built into all of that time is uh, once that ballot passes, um, NDOT would make an order on the materials. Those take a couple of months to to manufacturers ship here they don't store these somewhere on site be great but uh there's not not a big warehouse full of speed cushions those are actually ordered as they're needed and then they go into the contractor's queue that's the part that's taken a year yeah you're not seeing a year's worth of construction once they get out there i mean they they could probably do this in a couple of days uh, they'll, they'll be in and out uh, certainly much less impact than what you've seen with the sidewalk project Uh, we did cover the ballot. Uh, just a little information on who gets to vote on that. It's probably fairly self-explanatory, um, but it, it, any property owner that abuts the street, uh, we may have a church here and there. They do get to vote. Um, businesses are not uh, allowed to vote. Uh, this is really a, intended to be, again, that residential program. There are a lot of um, two units on one parcel, both of those units get to vote. Uh, even if one kind of sits behind the other and it's not directly on folks, uh, we still consider both owners to be owners in common of the piece of property that does abut the street. So they both get to vote. But uh, other than that, I think it's pretty straightforward on this project. There's some contact information. You know, we've, we've heard a lot today, a lot of really good input some for some against all of that is valid we respect everyone's opinion and that's why we give you the opportunity as a neighborhood to say this is for us or this is not and the way we think the best way to do that most fair is to go through that ballot process but if there's information you want to be sure we're aware 
of as we as we continue into the design process, feel free to reach out to me. I'm the green one below or in dot uh, the, the the one above or both of us, and uh, let let your thoughts be known that way. Feel free to get back to us uh, in the meantime. And then, as I mentioned, that's the link to the traffic calming webpage. You'll find a, a lot of information about the, the process and the policies, and you can see other design plans if you want. You can watch other meetings if you want. You can see that that map, that interactive map that we talked about. Just a lot of great information that NDOT has made available there. So I don't want to keep you any longer than uh, we need to be on a on a Saturday morning. Uh, but any final thoughts or questions, concerns? we sign off. This is Bernadette. I just want to say thank you. Thank you for taking time this morning to, to meet with us, to go through all of this, and to give us such a nice presentation. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you, Ms. Wells. Thanks for organizing this and for uh, uh, your, your participation you. in the process. And thanks to all of you. I hope you have a, a great Saturday. Thanks for taking your time this morning. Again, this meeting will be is being recorded. It'll be available here uh, probably the first part of next week. Feel free to log on and check that out. With that, we'll thank you for joining us. Have a great rest of your weekend.